I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Awakening Compassion in Healthcare Organizations. My name is Kim Valancourt. I am the webinar producer for the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare and your moderator for today's session. The Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare is a national leader in the movement to make compassion a vital element in every patient caregiver interaction. Before we begin the formal presentation, let's go over a few details about the webinar. The Schwartz Center Compassion in Action webinar series is funded in part by a donation in memory of Julian and Eunice Cohen. Today's program will be 60 minutes. The first 45 minutes will be presentation followed by a 10 minute question and answer session. Today's program is being recorded and will be available on the Schwartz Center website a week after the session. Please note that attendees are participating in listen-only mode, but can interact with the speakers and me by using the questions pane, which should be located on your screen. If you have questions during the session, please just type them into the questions pane and send them to us. We will address as many of them as we can at the end of the formal presentation. We will be polling the audience during today's session, and we hope that you will participate in this interactive measurement tool. Finally, as you exit the webinar, you will receive an electronic survey that we ask you to take a minute to complete so that we can capture your assessment of today's program. Your feedback is very important to us. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and our host for today's presentation, Dr. Beth Lown. She is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the medical director of the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare. Welcome, Beth. Thank you, Kim. Good afternoon to all of you, and thank you for joining us for our webinar series on compassionate collaborative care, or what we call the triple C. Our compassionate collaborative care framework describes some of the key values and behaviors that help us offer compassionate collaborative care to patients, families, colleagues, and coworkers, while also sustaining ourselves and our sense of meaning in our work. Our framework is available on the Schwartz Center website. This year, we've been focusing on creating organizational cultures of compassion. This was the focus of our recent inaugural annual Compassion in Action Healthcare Conference that we just held in Boston this past June. So let me now introduce today's session, Awakening Compassion in Healthcare Organizations. For those who missed her wildly popular session at the inaugural Compassion in Action Healthcare Conference, this webinar will inspire ideas for awakening compassion at the organizational and system levels in healthcare. While more and more evidence mounts that compassion matters for people doing the work of providing healthcare, it increases safety, promotes learning, prevents burnout, fosters collaboration, our organizations and systems are often poorly set up to make compassion part of our everyday working lives. So at the end of this webinar, Participants will be able to define the social architecture of an organization and explain its relevance to promoting compassion in work environments. You'll be able to articulate an evidence-based case for focusing on compassion at the organization and system level and to engage in creative and generative conversations that foster awakening compassion in organizations beyond a focus on just culture and values to include changes in an organization's network structures, role definitions, role crafting, and routines. So now it is really my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Monica Warline. She is the CEO of Enliven Work, a research scientist at Stanford University Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, and the Executive Director of Compassion Lab. Monica Warline, along with Jane Dutton, authored a new book, Awakening Compassion at Work, drawing from more than 15 years of research on compassion in organizations to offer a practical framework to understand how to awaken compassion across organizations and systems in a more sustainable fashion. Welcome, Monica. I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Beth. What a pleasure to join you for today's webinar with the Schwartz Center and to talk about what we've learned over 15 or 20 years of thinking about compassion in all kinds of organizations, including 
healthcare organizations. I'm just delighted to be sharing this work with you and uh, I so enjoyed the Compassion in Action in Healthcare conference. So this will be a little bit of a, a reprise of that workshop that I was able to do there and adding on a bit to that and I'm just delighted to share it with you and with your audience. So if we dive right in to the content that starts on slide number seven, um, I want to begin by uh, talking about why I'm so fascinated by com at, about compassion at an organizational level. <clears throat> I think it's often easy for us to think about compassion at a personal and interpersonal level, especially in healthcare when we think about those one-on-one -on -one interactions with patients or their families. But very early on in our work, my co-author and longtime collaborator, Jane Dutton, had a, a family tra um, tragedy happening in her family um, with the um, illness of a, her child. And she was appointed jointly in two different units inside the same university. And <clears throat> one of the things that she noticed as an organizational scholar going through her own difficult life episode was that one of those units made it so easy for her to have flexibility and to rearrange her teaching duties and to be relieved of her committee service and other kinds of things that just made it easier for her and her family to cope with what was happening in their lives. And in the other unit where she was appointed, although she had good colleagues there, they were very kind people, she really liked those people, and of course it was a part of the same broad institutional structure, there was almost no recognition of what was going on in her life outside of her work. There was no effort to introduce flexibility. There was no rearranging of any of her work-related responsibilities that would help her cope with what was happening in her family. And um, she stood back as someone interested in how organizational contexts shape our life experience and said, why is it that in two units that in many ways should behave, behave generally the same, you would have such a different experience of compassion at the organization level. And that motivated her to take up this uh, research topic. And we continued to be fascinated by this in one of our early studies we looked at how an organization responded to members of the organization that had lost everything in a, in a fire. And we saw that in one organization, um, also a university, people responded to the loss uh, in the fire with just an outpouring of goods and of emotional support and financial donations and the students rallied around the other students who'd lost everything in the fire and they started to recreate the notes and books from their program of study. And um, it was really an astounding, generous, wonderful, compassionate response across the entire unit um, where these people worked. And in uh, another organization, also a university, Again, very similar in all kinds of ways, same industry, same size, same kind of institution, um, generally the same population of people. There was zero recognition of the fire. It wasn't publicly acknowledged by the leadership. There was almost no raising of money or donation of goods to help the people who had lost everything. And um, we, again, became so curious about what in the organization itself was in one case really enhancing people's innate willingness to be compassionate to others who were suffering through a, this kind of a loss. And in the other organization filled with similarly kind and innately compassionate people, something was dampening their capacity and willingness to respond. And so this has been 
basically the trajectory of our work for 15 years to try to shed some light on this puzzle of uh, why some units amplify or facilitate compassion and other units or organizations really dampen or block it. So keep that puzzle in mind as we go ahead here through um, talking about what I mean by compassion. And um, if you look at most highly cited psychology definitions of compassion, you'll see the one um, that's listed here, where compassion is um, distinctive in that it involves sensitivity or pain to the suffering of another person or group of people, coupled with a deep desire to alleviate that suffering. And we as organizational scholars who are curious about what's happening in the context that affects compassion, adopt that definition, we just build on it a little bit. And the way that we build on it is by taking it out of simply the domain of psychology and thinking of compassion not just as an emotion or a motivational response to suffering, but actually thinking of it as a social process. And it's a social process that unfolds between people um, at least a person who is suffering and a person who is responding to that suffering, but often many more people are involved in this process. And we think of it as a process that unfolds over time and actually involves several different psychological dimensions. So when we think of the science of compassion in organizations, we use a process model like the one shown on this slide where some kind of expression of pain happens in the world. It might be a very small, minute expression. It might be a larger expression. And that pain or suffering has to be noticed by others in the social context. So that requires a certain amount of attention. When pain is noticed in organizations, it has to be interpreted in certain kinds of ways in order for compassion to unfold. And that interpretive process is complex and really important to understand as an organizational facilitator or an organizational obstacle. And the interpretation of compassion or of suffering that aids compassion the most is that the person who is in distress is really worthy of compassion and that I have the capacity, the resources, and the permission to act to address that suffering in some kind of way. So when that kind of interpretation happens in relation to pain or suffering in our workplaces, then all kinds of people start to feel empathy and concern, or this is what research psychologists call a particular form of empathy, empathic concern, which means that we feel concern for the other person's well-being. Even if we don't feel the same things that they feel, um, we have the capacity to want them to um, be well in their lives. And that feeling of empathic concern is related to an almost immediate motivation to do something and to act on their behalf. So if I just simplify this process down for you into four points, we, we study compassion in organizations as a four part human experience that unfolds in relation to suffering. It involves noticing, interpreting, feeling, and acting. And that's where I'm going to ask Kim to open up our first poll question, just to get a sense of which of those domains you're curious about. Thank you, Monica. Okay, our first polling question is coming up on the screen and reads, which of the four parts of this definition of compassion as a social process seems most important to you to explore further? Please select one from the following, noticing, directing attention towards suffering um, in the work, interpreting, making sense of ambiguous cues uh, generously, feeling, tapping into empathetic concern for others' well-being, or acting, Im improvisational and coordinated actions. We'll give it a couple more seconds while people um, enter their responses. It'll be interesting for us to see 
how our audience feels about this, and I'm sure that our speaker will give us some insights about that. Okay, it looks like we've had a really good response. Let's uh, close the poll and, and share the responses. Uh, noticing came in at 21%, interpreting at 32%, feeling at 8%, and acting at 40%. Uh, so, uh, Monica, any thoughts on the results of this poll? Yes, thank you, Kim and Beth. This is really uh, a fascinating poll and um, shows that we have a very action-oriented audience, which I love, so that um, people are really fascinated out about exploring the kinds of actions that come across as compassionate and closely followed on the heels by interpreting and how the interpretive process shapes compassion. So I'm going to focus just for a minute more on those two dimensions of the science of compassion since they jump out with our audience. First of all, uh, first off, uh, interpreting. As I mentioned, it's a really, really um, difficult in many organizations to interpret ambiguous behavior generously enough to foster compassion. And when you think about work organizations, um, suffering doesn't often show up in ways that make it easy for us to respond well. The most common ways that suffering shows up at, in work organizations is that somebody is chronically late for work, or they have a spate of unexplained absences, or they're more emotional than usual, and they may engage even in some kind of an outburst that is unusual for them and makes it really hard to know how to respond to them. And um, sometimes when people are really suffering in some way at work, they may make more errors than usual or make um, risky judgments. And so the fact that suffering shows up in those kinds of work behaviors means that we have to do a lot of interpretive work to sustain our compassion. We have to be willing to be gentle and generous with people when they make errors or when something unexplained is happening. And we have to use a lot of questions, um, a skill of what um, Ed Schein calls humble inquiry, right? That we, with humility and generosity, we ask people what's happening to understand more of it so that we ourselves have the capacity to interpret what's going on with more compassion. So when we're doing that work of interpretation through questions that draw the other people out and that illuminate what's going on, you know, what's behind these kind of unexplained behaviors, usually the actions that we want to take to be compassionate will become really obvious. So the interpretation and the action in that sense really go together well. And the best uh, the best compassionate actions in organizations are the ones that we call customized. That means that they're really tailored to the needs and preferences of the people who are in pain. Now, this is sometimes hard to do, and in large organizations, it can be tricky, but the more that we are in touch with how people are suffering and what they need, the more we can customize actions that are compassionate. And in general, for the people in the audience who are managers, I would just offer that some of the most often requested actions that are compassionate in the workplace have to do with creating greater flexibility. So people don't necessarily want or expect really big actions on their behalf. They're very grateful when people can cut them a little bit of slack or introduce some flexibility into their lives that allow them to handle situations with um, more um, customization to their unique life circumstances. So the four, um, those four dimensions of compassion are the first four on this slide that's showing on the screen. Noticing, interpreting, feeling, and acting with compassion. 
uh, is the interpersonal part of the science of compassion that's absolutely necessary for us to have competence in a system. But the other four that's on the screen, I have a very simple kind of symbolic equation here that says four times four equals compassion competence in a system. And the other four in that equation are dim dimensions of the organization itself, or what we call the social architecture of an organization. And those four dimensions are shown on slide 11. So when we talk about the social architecture of compassion, what we acknowledge is that noticing, interpreting, feeling, and responding are always happening inside a kind of invisible architecture that the organization provides that guides how we interact with each other. And we refer to these four dimensions of the social architecture as networks. And what we mean by networks particularly are the social networks or the way sociologists think of organizations. This is the structural relationship ties that govern a lot of what happens in an organization. Who talks to who? Who goes to who for advice? Who has to review work? Um, who thinks of themselves as part of the same group or not part of the same group? And those network structures can really impact the noticing, interpreting, feeling, and acting with compassion in a system. We talk about um, culture and especially the values embedded in a culture and the assumptions about human beings that a culture gives us as easy or hard to make. And the cultures that support compassion have values and assumptions about human beings that tend to reinforce that people are generally good, that people are generally trying to do the right thing, that people are generally worth trusting and that people generally deserve our compassion. So those assumptions can take many different kinds of words, but when a culture gives us those assumptions as part of our work environment, it's much easier to get compassion to scale across the organization. Another part of the social architecture that we can easily overlook in relation to compassion are roles and role definitions. So a sociologist might think of an organization actually as an ecology of roles. Um, roles are a kind of way of defining what we're responsible for and not responsible for in our work. And when we can help people expand their role definitions to incorporate compassion or care as a central part of what they're trying to do, no matter what other tasks fall within their role, we can actually help people engage in far more compassion across the entire organization in ways that we can't necessarily predict in advance. And then finally, the last part of the social architecture we call routines. Following organizational scholars, we define these as recurrent and interdependent ways of getting things done. So every organization has some central routines and then every organization has some very unique routines. But when you can think about routines and how you can infuse them with compassion, you really start to think about how to get compassion to spread and scale across an entire system. Because once you get compassion woven into a routine, that routine is something that must happen over and over and over again. It's a part of the way that people think about what it means to do their work every day. So I know this sounds a bit abstract. Um, that's the high level introduction to the social architecture. That's the, the I'm gonna end sociology and organizational psychology class right there now. And I'm gonna move on to slide 12 where I'm just gonna give you some examples of these different aspects of the social architecture to try to make this much more concrete about how it shows up in everyday work. So, when we think about how networks can awaken compassion, um, we think about something like this picture that's shown here that we created actually in conjunction with an organization we were working with on exactly this issue. 
Um, in this organization, they really wanted to foster and spread compassion across systems that were located in multiple geographic areas. And they had already in place what they called a Values in Action Award winners. And lots of organizations have something like this, where they recognize a group of people for doing something that the organization values. And what we worked with the organization to see was that they could take those Values in Action Award winners and tie them to their compassion efforts. And they could bring those Values in Action Award winners across all of their sites together and let them meet each other. And they would become a kind of natural group within the organization if we invited them to do that. And they are the ones who would be really fired up about helping awaken compassion across the system. So getting them to think of themselves as a group could be really helpful. And then we started to ask the question, when we have them together as a group, how could we introduce other groups to their energy and their passion? So we made sure that at some part of this gathering where we got all the Values in Action award winners together, we also introduced the executive leaders to this group so that the executives who were passionate about this could catch a little bit of fire from the employees who were passionate about this. And we tried to find different ways to recognize each of the managers that managed one of these Values in Action award winners so that we started to create a sense of managers within the system who were invested in awakening compassion. And that effort was so fun and interesting and successful that it turned into an annual employee event. And people became very passionate about this and more and more and more people began to get involved and want to be invited and the um, Values in, in Action Award winners from the year before would induct the new award winners for the next year, creating a kind of naturally growing group, all of whom were really interested in awakening compassion across the system. So that's a way that you can think of using networks within your organization to really scale and advance compassion by tapping into the energy that's already there and the people who already care about compassion and collaboration. So let's go to slide 13 and think a little bit about examples of culture and values. When we think as organizational scholars about culture change and values in organizations, we often encourage people to think about this deeply and to care about this deeply, but not to make it their only lever. Because the temptation for leaders in organizations is to change the value statement, to rewrite the mission statement, or to do some other way of modifying the language, but then to stop there and not to understand that culture and values that awaken compassion are the culture and values that are lived out in people's everyday experience of the work. And um, there are lots of ways to go from writing the mission statement or writing the purpose statement or putting the values on the wall to making them a part of the lived experience of work every day. And one of my favorite examples of how an organization made this turn is a healthcare organization that uh, was working across an entire county and they got a new leader who was really interested in what were the change efforts that had been done up to this point to make this entire county healthier. And the people who had been deeply involved in doing the change work and trying to introduce compassion and population health and thinking about serving underserved populations and those kinds of things in the system, were, had worked very hard and, and felt like um, their work had often um, been under-recognized. And so one of them spoke up to the new leader in a very authentic way and said, when I look across the change efforts in this organization, what I see 
our human remains strewn in the ditches. And I don't know about you, but I almost can't read that quote every time I read it without just choking up because I can imagine the pressure of being a professional person in a meeting like this with a brand new leader and being brave enough to speak that kind of a truth about what was happening in the organization that said that it valued compassion, but that was enacting change in a way that felt like it was leaving people dead by the side of the road. And the, the leader, um, really to the credit of this leader, was able to hear that and said, well, absolutely, from now on, we must not make any more change decisions as a group, as a leadership group, unless we understand what it's going to mean for the lived experience of this organization. So how can we do that? And together with that kind of a commitment, this leadership team came up with a way of decision making that every time they needed to change something deep within the system, they would put together what they called a field trip committee. And the field trip committee was a cross-functional committee, also cross-level, so um, from front line all the way to top leader and many different functions represented in the field trip committee. And they would do just what the field trip committee sounds like. They would go on a field trip to a site that was relevant to the change initiative. And they would work with that site to actually do the work in the way that it was proposed to change. So if they were changing some kind of a transportation routine within the hospital or between sites, they would actually ride along with people in the transportation routine and supervise the transportation routine and supervise the supervisors of the transportation routine to really see what happened on the ground in the lived experience if you made the kind of change that was on the table. And those field trip committees almost always came back to the leadership team with much better ways to enact the change that would not create the sense of human beings being cast aside. Um, and that would actually make the change easier to implement and more effective, but also that would keep it in line with the, the value and the emphasis on creating a more compassionate organization and creating more compassionate care. So that's an example of how if you really want to awaken compassion in your culture, you can move toward evaluating, decision-making, thinking, leading, and managing that pays attention to the everyday experience of compassion that employees and patients and families have within the system as just as important as any other parameter that you're thinking of in your decision-making or in your change process. Let's switch our focus to the third part of the social architecture and talk a little bit more about roles and how we can think of roles across an organization as awakening compassion. The body of work that lies behind this idea about roles and awakening compassion is a body of work that I really love. And uh, again, my collaborator and co-author Jane Dutton in conjunction with Amy Rosneski at Yale and Justin Berg at Stanford have done some groundbreaking work on what they call job crafting. So you may have heard of that work. Um, the idea of job crafting is that roles are very malleable. And um, when we occupy a role, part of what we first do is learn what's expected of us. So it's very important that the organization convey expectations about how they set up a role and how they define a role and how they describe it in the formal job description and how they introduce people to the role and so on. So that's what we call in sociology role taking. But if the job crafting work shows us that as people occupy a role for a while, they also craft the role uniquely to make it their own and to help it express what they see as their unique stamp on the work. So um, they, people craft roles to do different kinds of tasks. People craft roles to interact with other people in the organization in unique ways and to form and maintain relationships. 
And people craft roles in relation to the meaning of the work that they hold or that they want to create. And so I think a lot of attention has been paid and is being paid now to how we might help uh, physicians recraft the role of physician in the new economy of healthcare. How can we help physicians return to understanding their role as one of um, compassion provider? How can we help the uh, physician and the patient connect more? And how does that reintroduce the purpose of medicine in a new way and change um, the meaning of the practice for physicians? And I think that's a very good example in healthcare of how paying attention to what the role of physician is in both a formal way and in a crafted way can help awaken more compassion across the system. I think in some organizations, the same effort is happening for nurses, that we're paying attention to the fact that nurses often enter the profession of medicine with a deep intention to empathize and care for other people. And that aspects of the system, the time pressure, the reimbursement pressure, all the financial and regulatory constraints can strip away that sense of purpose over time. And that a big part of what compassionate care means is helping reintroduce that sense of purpose into the role of nursing and to remind people of ways that they can reconnect with their original passion around health and health care and um, being a part of um, the medical system as a caring system. So those are great examples in healthcare about how already lots of work is trying to help people use existing roles to awaken compassion. Um, some of our research actually focuses on other kinds of roles and has, I think, become also pretty well-known examples. So um, some of our work is work that um, showed that cleaners and housekeepers in healthcare systems can actually really change the meaning of their work and the experience of compassion for patients and families. When they redefine the role of cleaner or environmental steward with a sense of care and compassion in what they do. And um, we studied a group of cleaners in some hospital systems that um, even went so far as to change the paintings on the walls across the rooms that they were caring for because they wanted the patients and the families to have a fresh sense of things and to have um, a sense that time was passing and that they were getting better and that soon they were going to be able to go home. So there are all kinds of ways that uh, people across many different kinds of roles in healthcare can be connected to a sense of purpose and a mission around compassion. And they will then change what they think of as their responsibility in order to awaken compassion within their role. And this is a, a way that, as I said before, you can get all kinds of expressions of compassion that you never would have thought of. But when people think of it as a part of their job to offer compassion to those around them, uh, many new kinds of actions start to spring up. And then finally, if we turn our attention to routines on slide 15, um, <clears throat> I think that thinking about routines with compassion is so important in healthcare. And I know from many, um, talking with many of my friends who work in healthcare settings, from doing research in healthcare settings, even from talking with Beth, that it's like, oh, don't talk to me about one more routine. I have to talk about routines coming out the wazoo. And every time I turn around, there's some kind of more change in a routine. And of course, when organizational systems adopt something like lean, or when you think about operational effectiveness, you're going to be thinking about changing routines. And that kind of change can become very wearing on people, which is all the more reason to think about compassion in relation to routines. And I get really passionate about this. I hope it's coming through the phone lines at you um, because it's easy to change people's work routines without an eye toward whether it enables them to do compassionate work. And 
as you do that, you can create all kinds of obstacles to compassion in your system. But if you flip the assumption and you think that every time you are changing something to introduce effectiveness in your organization, you can simultaneously introduce more compassion, then every time you engage in some kind of change in an organizational routine, you can also be awakening compassion across the system. And just a couple of examples of this kind of thinking in action in real work that we're doing right now. Um, one, uh, I find a really fun story. Uh, here at the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research, we hosted a group of, of healthcare change agents um, inside of a, a number of very large community health systems. And that was really fun. We had change agents from across the system. So we had physicians, nurses, administrators, leaders, all kinds of auxiliary care, occupational care positions. We had social workers, um, just people from all over the system who really wanted to change these community health systems to have more compassion. They're already deeply compassionate people, already motivated. And what they needed, of course, from us was not a lecture on how to be more compassionate people, right? They already had that um, deeply motivated from within. What they needed was a view into how could they change the systems that they felt so trapped in so that there was a little bit more room to enact the compassion that they felt. And so we spent a lot of time with that group, having them go through their daily routines and do a diagnostic process about which ones they felt most capable of changing and which ones they thought could be most easily influenced to be more compassionate. And one group in particular landed on their hiring routine because in their particular case, the way that they hired uh, new staff was so separate from their existing staff that existing staff had no role in reviewing candidates, in interviewing candidates, in selecting candidates, in meeting them before they showed up, or in socializing them and onboarding them. There was just all of a sudden a new person appeared on their floor and with no introduction, with no socialization process, they were supposed to now be a part of the work. And um, they, they saw really quickly that they could hire and onboard in a really different way that would increase the relational capacity of the system. And as they did that, they would really awaken opportunity for more compassion between employees within the system, which is something that's deeply correlated with more compassion to the patients and families of the system. And so one of the people working on that committee pulled me aside after four days of thinking about their routines and said, Monica, at first when they said we were going to come here and do five days of compassion work, I thought that I was just wanted to cut my head off because I had no idea what I was going to learn about five days of compassion. I thought I already knew everything. And never in a million years did I think that what I would end up doing is revamping our entire hiring routine. This is incredible. And I hope I'm conveying that the person said that with a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> but there was actually real substantive, implementable organizational change that that group could see would automatically increase the capacity for compassion. And it was embedded in the way the organization was doing something that it has to do anyway. Um, another example, I'm breathless about giving these examples, Beth. I love these examples so much. Um, but another example of a routine that we're working with now and that we're really intrigued by is working with the shift change routine. In, in healthcare settings, the shift change routine is so important. As you know, it's a locus of safety. If there are errors in the shift handoff, there, those errors often um, reverberate through the system in really costly and painful ways. So there's been a lot of emphasis on making shift reports more technically accurate and um, focusing on the shift 
the, the, the change of shift protocols to make sure that they're robust from um, excellent care point of view. What hasn't simultaneously happened and is just a lost opportunity is to, while we're doing that work, also look at the change of shift report, at the protocol, at the way that the routine is enacted between people as a locus for compassion. So we worked with a group of nurses and other kinds of practitioners in a very large healthcare system and had them diagnose if they could change one routine that they thought would really change their life, what would it be? And the one routine that they chose was the shift change. Um, one of the nurses said to me, I come to work every day with a knot in my stomach because I just don't know what I'm going to find on that shift change. And I'm so nervous about it. Uh, and so we created a discussion-based one-hour protocol that's pretty simple and um, pretty cost-effective. It's just an hour. Um, it's a focus group protocol that introduces a little bit about compassion and mindful relationships, and then it, it invites people to have a discussion about how they might do their shift change with more compassion and why they would want to do that. And at the end of that hour, they make one small commitment that they're willing to make about how they could do their shift change differently to introduce more compassion. And we focus on compassion for oneself, compassion for one's colleagues, and compassion for the patient. So the way we introduce compassion in this little um, shift change intervention is a three-way model of compassion. And what we're finding after just an hour short intervention and a couple of online follow-ups is that six months later, that change in uh, the shift change routine is making a measurable difference in the quality of life and, and work satisfaction scores for people working in the units. And it's starting also as we spread it to make a measurable different in, difference in the patient satisfaction scores that we're looking at. So with those examples, I think we can move on, Kim, to our last polling question. Thank you, Monica. Our uh, second polling question is coming up on the screen and reads, which aspect of the social architecture intrigues you the most as a new source for awakening compassion in your system? Please select one of the following, networks, structural links and relational ties between people, culture, values and assumptions that shape meaning and action, roles, zones of responsibility that are defined or crafted, or routines, recurrent interdependent ways to accomplish work. If you'll take a second to enter your responses, we will get that into the system and share those responses and get some feedback from our speaker today. We'll leave that open just a couple more seconds. I thank you all for your participation. Great. We have a great response rate. Let's close that and take a look at the responses. We have 22% who have said networks, 37% say culture, 15% say roles, and 26% of our audience said routines. Monica, any thoughts on this poll before we jump back into the presentation? Yeah, thank you, Kim. I'm really gratified to see that people are most curious about culture and especially it, with talking about culture as how to make the lived values and the lived human assumptions of work more aligned with compassion. I think that's deeply embodied in the work of the Schwartz Center. I think it's so much a part of the kind of change that the Schwartz Center is fostering. And so it makes sense to me that that would jump out to people and I find it so important for us to talk about culture change, not just as the symbolics of a culture change, but also as the deeply embedded values and the lived assumptions. So I think we can use this. I, was, I wanted to do this poll um, because I was really curious about what would resonate with the audience. Um, so thank you all for 
um, satisfying my curiosity as a part of this. And I think we can just leave this slide up here while I invite you all to think about questions that you might have. Um, just as a reminder of, remember I said it takes the four parts of compassion as an interpersonal process. So it takes noticing suffering, interpreting it generously, feeling empathic concern, and acting with compassion, multiplied by the culture that we find ourselves in and the way that the culture fosters and makes it easy for us to respect each other, to treat each other as valued team members, to trust each other and know that everybody is trying to do the right thing and everybody wants to pitch in. And something that I think is so important about culture and values as a space of organizational change is that the more that we make those kinds of fundamental assumptions about our work and our colleagues, the easier it becomes to handle the complexity that suffering throws our way in our work. So I really think uh, it's important to focus on culture and to make our focus on culture much deeper than just a symbolic shift and to think about how we make it a lived experience. And um, Beth, I bet you have a lot to say about that. Well, Monica, first of all, thank you. This was really helpful. I was actually taking notes madly as you were speaking, even though I heard you speak at our conference. But I've learned even more today just about some very practical suggestions um, and your focus group protocol, for example, to just insert one, one small test of change that has huge implications. In fact, we had one participant in the webinar um, ask about the shift change uh, uh, example that you shared. And in this particular person was interested in knowing more about what actually was done as a result of that uh, protocol and the actions that that group took. Do you, do you have that information? Yes, I'll be happy to share some examples. Um, and the important thing to know about the way we are running that intervention is that it's not um, prescriptive in the sense that we aren't gathering up everybody's responses and aggregating in the, and, and then saying, okay, here's the one thing that you must do. So our, our, the theory of change that we're working on in that intervention is that if we invite people to reimagine doing the routine in line with compassion in ways that fit with them, um, mm -hmm. that the routine will be flexible enough, but of course rigid enough that different people enacting different things will get us toward where we want to go. So I just want to say at a high level, that's an important mm -hmm. theory behind the way we're handling the intervention. But the kinds of things that people choose to do are something that you know I've learned, but it continues to inspire me and challenge me over time, is that it's really small moves that matter so much. So many, many, many people after that focus group will choose as their first step to do three mindful breaths before they begin their shift report. Mm -hmm. And that's just all, you know, it seems like such a small move, but from everything that we know about uh, about the emerging work on mindfulness and uh, about the emotion regulation involved in the shift change, that those three mindful breaths as a steadying influence can prepare people to enter their their work relationship in a really different way. So that's a very common choice. Um, other people choose something that has to do with emotional expression. So a lot of people say, I will actually intentionally, deliberately smile at my oncoming colleague. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're just a positive emotional display that's intentional. Uh, it's a very small move that can shift the emotional tone of the whole encounter. Another common choice for people to make is to name something that went really well on the shift 
um, and invite the other person to name something that they're looking forward to or something that they're grateful for so that there's mm -hmm. an intentional beginning of a positive expression of some kind so that the shift change starts off with a relational exchange that includes positive emotion. And we did a lot of observational research as we were designing this intervention. And a part of what we noticed is that in um, the most pressured cases, and pretty commonly, shift reports, change of shift reports were done without people ever making eye contact with one another. I mean, they could just be looking at the medical record the whole time and speaking so that they could hear each other, but never actually making eye contact with their fellow uh, employees, their fellow colleagues. So the interventions on the surface look really small, but there's lots of reason in the research literature to believe that they're really impactful. It's so interesting. So it's not, I think, because I think probably what people are envisioning is sort of a protocol, a handoff language, sort of a standardized way of speaking to each other, and it's not that at all. You introduce the principles, you get people to sort of chew on them together in community, and then everybody decides for him or herself what they're going to do. Yes. So there is, you know, there's a high level set of principles that guide this, that, that what they're going to do have to be in line with what we know uh, generally cultivates compassion. But the mm -hmm. flexibility to enact it in a way that makes sense to you, that fits with your style and who you are, that feels authentic and that isn't scripted is actually, mm -hmm. I think, a part of what makes it powerful and compassionate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Totally agree. Um, gosh, it's not that we want to spend another half hour, but we only have about four more minutes. And I wanted to ask you this question from one of the participants who asks about some feasible ways that health organizational leadership could support job crafting or role crafting with physicians to increase the interaction with patients. Mm, yes. Uh, one resource that can be very helpful pragmatically is that um, if you go to the, if you query the Center for Positive Organizations at the University of Michigan, they have a job crafting guide and they have some resources that you can download there. So that's pragmatically very helpful. And at the highest level, what the job crafting guide helps you do and that you can easily do in a, in a workshop style format with people that's very meaningful is to um, understand what tasks you're doing that comprise your work, understand what relationships you're engaging in that comprise your work, and understanding what meaning you're making, what cognitive meaning you're making of the work right now. And then mm -hmm. you do that activity for how you would ideally like to be doing the work. So what mm -hmm. tasks would you love to be doing? What relationships would you love to be enacting? And what meanings would you love to be holding for your work? And just com comparing the two lists and talking about strategies of how to move from one to the other really facilitates people's job crafting. Mm, that's great. University of Michigan Center for Positive Organizations. Okay, I think we have time actually for one more question and a lot of people want to know how do you get leadership to buy into this, leadership and management. So we always get those kinds of questions. Can you take a Yes, I can talk about that. I actually have a whole <laughs> webinar just on that topic, which uh, we oh, agreed boy. not to focus on in this one. But I, um, the short answer to that question is that um, there's a real emerging consensus about a crisis of burnout and resilience in the healthcare sector. And there is mm -hmm. such a need to lead with people's well-being in mind that almost mm. every healthcare system that I go into has an initiative around resilience or an initiative around staff well-being or an initiative around employee engagement. And if you can latch on to any of those that are already in the organizational dialogue, there is mm -hmm. lots of research to show that a compassionate approach to engagement or to well-being 
is really effective and more effective than lots of other kinds of approaches that you could take. And um, mm -hmm. in our book, Awakening Compassion at Work, we have a whole chapter on making the case for Compassion at Work. So that could be a helpful resource for people. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'd, I'd highly recommend your book, Monica. I read it and I thought it was really, really helpful and practical. I thought it was fantastic. Um, well, I think we have run out of time, which is really a shame. I really enjoyed this, so I want to thank you so much for uh, being here with us today, being with us at our conference. Uh, it's just been so incredibly helpful. Um, so I think um, I'm going to turn this back over to Kim to close up the webinar and invite people to fill up our um, feedback forms so that we can um, continue to tailor these webinars to your needs. Kim. Thank you, Dr. Lone. I would again like to thank Dr. Warline for sharing her insights with us as well as everyone in the audience for setting aside time in your busy day to participate. We hope you enjoyed this fourth in a series of webinars focused on organizational cultures of compassion. We also hope that you will join us in Boston for our, our highly rated interprofessional continuing education course October 29th through the 30th. You can register for the course through the Schwartz Center homepage and please visit our, visit our website to learn more about the Schwartz Center, our membership program and upcoming programs. We know how busy all of you are but we would very much appreciate your taking a moment to complete the electronic survey upon exiting today's program as we value your input. Thank you all and have a great day.